Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we have completed our studies through the Road to Calvary, parts one, two, and three. Then we entered into a study on humility, and today we are beginning a study, which is also by Andrew Murray, and it is titled, Absolute Surrender. Now, it is my prayer at this point, you have been through the Road to Calvary series studies, and you have been through the study of humility. If you have, that would lay a perfect foundation to pick up where we are today. And again, it is this topic of absolute surrender. What does that truly mean in the life of the follower of Jesus? What are we to surrender to, and how absolutely is that surrender required? Well, we are told in 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all of his hosts together, and there were 32 kings with him, and horses, and chariots. And he went up and he besieged Samaria, and he warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. What Ben-Hadad had asked was absolute surrender, and what Ahab gave was what was asked of him absolute surrender. I want to use these words, my Lord, O King, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. I want to use these words as the words of absolute surrender with which every child of God ought to yield himself to his father. Again, the words that must be repeated by every Christian is my Lord, O King, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. We have heard it before, but we need to hear it very definitely. The condition of God's blessing is absolute surrender of all into his hands. Praise God. If our hearts are willing for that, there is no end to what God will do for us and to the blessing that God will bestow upon us. Absolute surrender. Let me tell you where I got those words. I use them myself often, and you have heard them numberless times. But in Scotland, once I was in a company where we were talking about the condition of Christ's church and what the great need of the church and of believers is. And there was in our company a godly worker who has much to do in training workers. And I asked him what he would say was the great need of the church and the message that ought to be preached. He answered very quietly and simply and determinably by simply saying, absolute surrender to God is the one thing. The word struck me as never before. And that man began to tell how in the workers with whom he had to deal, he finds that if they are sound on that point, even though they be backward, they are willing to be taught and helped, and they always improve. Whereas others who are not sound on that point, they very often go back and leave the work. The condition for obtaining God's full blessing is not how correct you are in your doctrine, it is only your absolute surrender to him. And now, I desire by God's grace to give you this message, that your God in heaven answers the prayers which you have offered for blessing on yourselves and for blessing on those around you by this one demand. Are you willing 
to surrender yourselves absolutely into his hands. What is our answer to be? God knows there are hundreds of hearts who have said it, and there are hundreds more who long to say it, but hardly dare to do so. And there are hearts who have said it, but who have yet miserably failed, and who feel themselves condemned because they did not find the secret of the power to live that life. May God have a word for all. Let me say first of all that God claims it from us. Yes, it has its foundation in the very nature of God. God cannot do otherwise. Who is God? Well, he is the fountain of life, the only source of existence and power and goodness. And throughout the universe, there is nothing good but what God works. God has created the sun. He's created the moon and the stars, the flowers and the trees and the grass. And are they not all absolutely surrendered unto God? Do they not allow God to work in them just what he pleases? When God clothes the lily with its beauty, is it not yielded up, surrendered, given over to God as he works in it, its beauty? And God's redeemed children, oh, can you think that God can work his work if there is only half or a part of them surrendered? God cannot do it. God is life and love and blessing and power and infinite beauty. And God delights to communicate himself to every child who is prepared to receive him. But ah, this one lack of absolute surrender is just the thing that hinders God. And now he comes, and as God, he claims it. You know in daily life what absolute surrender is. You know that everything has to be given up to its special, definite object and service. I have a pen in my pocket, and that pen is absolutely surrendered to the one work of writing, and that pen must be absolutely surrendered to my hand if I am to write properly with it. If another holds it partly, I cannot write properly. And now, do you expect that in your immortal being, in the divine nature that you have received by regeneration, God can work his work every day and every hour unless you are entirely given up to him? God cannot. The temple of Solomon was absolutely surrendered to God when it was dedicated to him. And every one of us is a temple of God in which God will dwell and work mightily on one condition, absolute surrender unto him. God claims it. God is worthy of it. And without it, God cannot work his blessed work in us. But secondly, God not only claims it, but God will work it himself. I am sure there is many a heart that has said, Ah, but that absolute surrender implies so much. Someone says, Oh, I have passed through so much trial and suffering, and there is so much of the self-life still remaining and I dare not face the entire giving of it up, because I know it will cause so much trouble and agony. Alas, alas, that God's children have such thoughts of him, such cruel thoughts. Oh, I come to you with a message, fearful and anxious one. God does not ask you to give the perfect surrender in your strength or by the power of your will. God is willing to work it in you. Do we not read in Philippians 2.13, It is God that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure? And that is what we should seek for, to go on our faces before God until our hearts learn to believe that the everlasting God himself will come in to turn out what is wrong, to conquer what is evil, and to work what is well-pleasing in his blessed sight. God himself will work it in you. Look at the men in the Old Testament like Abraham. Do you think it was by accident that God found that man, the father of the faithful and the friend of God, and that it was Abraham himself apart from God who had such faith 
in such obedience, in such devotion? You know it is not so. God raised him up and prepared him as an instrument for his glory. Did not God say to Pharaoh, For this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power? And if God said that of him, will not God say it far more of every child of his? Oh, I want to encourage you, and I want you to cast away every fear. Come with that feeble desire. And if there is the fear which says, Oh, my desire is not strong enough. I am not willing for everything that may come. I do not feel bold enough to say I can conquer everything. Well, then I pray you learn to know and trust your God now. Say unto him, My God, I am willing that thou shouldest make me willing. If there is anything holding you back or any sacrifice you are afraid of making, come to God now and prove how gracious your God is. And be not afraid that he will command from you what he will not bestow. God comes and offers to work this absolute surrender in you. All these searchings and hungerings and longings that are in your heart, I tell you, friend, they are the drawings of the divine magnet Christ Jesus. He lived the life of absolute surrender. He has possession of you. He is living in your heart by his Holy Spirit. You have hindered and hindered him terribly, but he desires to help you to get hold of him entirely. And he comes and draws you now by his message and his words. Will you not come and trust God to work in you that absolute surrender to himself? Yes, blessed be God. He can do it and he will do it. The third thought I would like to share with you is that God not only claims it, he not only works it, but God accepts it when we bring it unto him. God works it in the secret of our heart. God urges us by the hidden power of his Holy Spirit to come and speak it out. And we have to bring and to yield to him that absolute surrender. But remember, when you come and bring God that absolute surrender, it may, as far as your feelings or your consciousness goes, be a thing of great imperfection. And you may doubt and hesitate and say, is it absolute? But oh, remember, there was once a man to whom Christ had said, if thou canst only believe, all things are possible to him whom believes. And his heart was afraid, and he cried out, and he said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. That was a faith that triumphed over the devil, and the evil spirit was cast out. And if you come and say, Lord, I yield myself in absolute surrender to my God, even though it be with a trembling heart and with the consciousness, I do not feel the power. I do not feel the determination. I do not feel the assurance. I know that it will succeed. Be not afraid, but come just as you are. And even in the midst of your trembling, the power of the Holy Spirit will work. Have you never yet learned the lesson that the Holy Spirit works with mighty power while on the human side everything else appears feeble? Look at the Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane. We read that he, through the eternal spirit, offered himself a sacrifice unto God. The almighty spirit of God was enabling him to do it. And yet what agony and fear and exceeding sorrow came over him. And oh, how he prayed. Externally, you can see no sign of the mighty power of the spirit. But the Spirit of God was there nonetheless. And even so, while you are feeble and fighting and trembling, in faith, in the hidden work of God's Spirit, do not fear, only yield yourself. And when you do yield yourself in absolute surrender, let it be in the faith that God does now accept of it. That is the great point, and that is what we so often miss. 
that believers should be thus occupied with God in this matter of surrender. I pray you, be occupied with God. We want to get help, every one of us, so that in our daily life, God shall be clearer to us. God shall have the right place and that God shall be all in all. And if we are to have that through life, let us begin now and look away from ourselves and let us look up to God. Let each believe while I, a poor worm on earth and a trembling child of God, full of failure and sin and fear, bow here and no one knows what passes through my heart. And while I in simplicity say, O God, I accept thy terms. I have pleaded for blessing on myself and others. I have accepted thy terms of absolute surrender. While your heart says that in deep silence, remember there is a God present that takes note of it. And he writes it down in his book. And there is a God present who at that very moment takes possession of you. You may not feel it. You may not realize it, but God takes possession if you will trust him. A fourth thought, God not only claims it, he not only works it, he not only accepts it, but God maintains it. That is the great difficulty with many. People will say, I have often been stirred at a meeting or at a convention, and I have consecrated myself to God but it soon passes away. I know it may last for a week or for a month, but eventually it fades, and after time, it's all gone. But listen, it is because you do not believe what I am now going to tell you and remind you of. When God has begun the work of absolute surrender in you, and when God has accepted your surrender, then God holds himself bound to care for it and to keep it. Will you believe that? In this matter of surrender, there are two, God and I. I, a worm, and God, the everlasting and omnipotent Jehovah. Worm, will you be afraid to trust yourself to this mighty God now? God is willing do you not believe that he can keep you continually, day by day and moment by moment? If God allows the sun to shine upon you moment by moment without intermission, will not God let his life shine upon you every moment? And why have you not experienced it? Because you have not trusted God for it, and you do not surrender yourself absolutely to God in that trust. A life of absolute surrender has its difficulties. I do not deny that. Yes, it has something far more than difficulties. It is a life that with men is absolutely impossible. But by the grace of God, by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, it is a life to which we are destined and a life that is possible for us, praise God. Let us believe that God will maintain it. Some of you have read the words of that aged saint who on his 90th birthday told of all God's goodness to him. I'm speaking of George Mueller. What did he say he believed to be the secret of his happiness and of all the blessing which God had given him? He said that he believed there were two reasons. The one was that he had been enabled by grace to maintain a good conscience before God day by day. And the second was that he was a lover of God's word. Ah, oh, yes, a good conscience is complete obedience to God day by day and fellowship with God every day in his word and prayer. That is a life of absolute surrender. Such a life has two sides. On the one side, absolute surrender to work what God wants you to do. On the other side, to let God work what he wants you to do. First, let's talk about to do what God wants you to do. Give up yourselves absolutely to the will of God. You know something of that will. Not enough. 
far from all. But say absolutely to the Lord God, by thy grace, I desire to do thy will in everything, every moment of every day. Say, Lord God, not a word upon my tongue, but for thy glory, not a movement of my temper, but for thy glory, not an affection of love or hate in my heart, but for thy glory and according to thy blessed will. Someone says, do you think that is possible? I ask, what has God promised you? And what can God do to fill a vessel absolutely surrendered to him? Oh, God wants to bless you in a way beyond what you expect. From the beginning, ear hath not heard, neither hath the eye seen, what God hath prepared for them that wait for him. God has prepared unheard of things, blessings much more wonderful than you can imagine, more mighty than you can conceive. They are divine blessings. Oh, won't you say now, I give myself absolutely to God, to his will, to do only what God wants. It is God who will enable you to carry out the surrender. Well, to the second point of surrendering to let God work what he wants to do, which is the other side of the coin, come and say, I give myself absolutely to God to let him work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure as he has promised to do so. Yes, the living God wants to work in his children in a way that we cannot understand, but that God's word has revealed and he wants to work in us every moment of the day. God is willing to maintain our lives. Only let our absolute surrender be one of simple, childlike, and unbounded trust. The last thought to share, this absolute surrender to God will wonderfully bless us. What Ahab said to his enemy, King Ben-Hadad, My Lord, O King, according to thy word I am thine, and all that I have. Shall we not say to our God and our loving Father as well? If we do say it, God's blessing will come upon us. God wants us to be separate from the world. We are called to come out from the world that hates God. Come out for God and say, Lord, anything for thee. If you say that with prayer and you speak that into God's ear, he will accept it, and he will teach you what it means. I say again, friend, God will bless you. You have been praying for blessing. You've been seeking it and asking for it. But do remember, there must be absolute surrender. At every tea table, you see it. Why is tea poured into that cup? Because it is empty, and it is given up for the tea. But put ink or vinegar or wine into it, and will they pour the tea into the vessel? Of course not. And in the same way, can God fill you? Can God bless you if you are not absolutely surrendered to him? He cannot. Let us believe God has wonderful blessings for us all. If we will but stand up for God and say, be it with trembling will, Yet with a believing heart, O oh God, I accept thy demands. I am thine in all that I have. Absolute surrender is what my soul yields to thee by divine grace. You may not have such strong and clear feelings of deliverances as you would desire to have, but humble yourselves in his sight and acknowledge that you have grieved the Holy Spirit by your self-will by your self-confidence and your self-effort. Bow humbly before him in the confession of that and ask him to break the heart and to bring you into the dust before him. Then, as you bow before him, just accept God's teaching that in your flesh there dwelleth no good thing 
and that nothing will help you except another life which must come in. You must deny self once and for all. Denying self must every moment be the power of your life, and then Christ will come in and take possession of you. When was Peter delivered? When was the change in him accomplished? The change began with Peter weeping, and the Holy Spirit came down and filled his heart. God the Father loves to give us the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. We come to God confessing that and praising God for it, and yet confessing how we have grieved His Spirit. And then we bow our knees to the Father to ask that He would strengthen us with all might by His Spirit in the inner man, and that He would fill us with His mighty power. And as the Spirit reveals Christ to us, Christ comes to live in our hearts forever, and the self-life is cast out. Let us bow before God in humility, and in that humility confess before him the state of the whole church. No words can tell the sad state of the church of Christ on earth. I wish I had words to speak what I sometimes feel about it. Just think of the Christians around you. I do not speak of nominal Christians or of professing Christians, but I speak of hundreds and thousands of honest, earnest Christians who are not living a life in the power of God or to his glory. So little power, so little devotion or consecration to God, so little perception of the truth that a Christian is a man utterly surrendered to God's will. Oh, we want to confess the sins of God's people around us and to humble ourselves. We are members of that sickly body, and the sickliness of the body will hinder us. It will break us down unless we come to God and in confession separate ourselves from partnership with worldliness, with coldness toward each other, unless we give up ourselves to be entirely and wholly for God. How much Christian work is being done in the spirit of the flesh and in the power of self? How much work, day by day, in which human energy, our will, and our thoughts about the work is continually manifested, and in which there is but little of waiting upon God and upon the power of the Holy Ghost? Let us make confession, but as we confess the state of the church, and the feebleness and sinfulness of work for God among us, let us come back to ourselves. Who is there who truly longs to be delivered from the power of the self-life? Who truly acknowledges that it is the power of self and the flesh, and who is willing to cast all at the feet of Christ? There is deliverance in Jesus, friends. I heard of one who had been an earnest Christian, and who spoke about the cruel thought of separation and death. But you do not think that, do you? What are we to think of separation and death? This, death was the path to glory for Christ. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The cross was the birthplace of his everlasting glory. Do you love Christ? Do you long to be in Christ, and not only like him? Let death be to you the most desirable thing on earth, death to self, and fellowship with Christ. And let this death lead you to separation. Do you think it is a hard thing to be called to be entirely free from the world, and that by separating yourself from the world to be united to God and his love, by separating yourself to become prepared for living and walking with God every day? Surely one ought to say anything to bring me to separation, bring me to death, for a life of full fellowship with God and Christ. Come, friend, and cast this self-life and flesh life at the feet of Jesus. Then trust him. Do not worry yourselves with trying to understand all about it. 
but come in the living faith that Christ will come into you with the power of his death and the power of his life. And then the Holy Spirit will bring the whole Christ, Christ crucified and risen and living in glory. The Holy Spirit will bring that Christ into your heart. And that's going to bring us to the end of chapter one today, friends. But I want to close by repeating the words that we read earlier when we were told that our prayer should be simply this, Lord God, not a word upon my tongue, but for thy glory, not a movement of my temper, but for thy glory, not an affection of love or hate in my heart, but for thy glory and according to thy blessed will. Oh, friends, how short we fall. Now may the Lord Jesus, the King of glory, may his blessings be upon your walk day by day, as he wills. And until next time, I truly love you, friends. I'll see you on the next video.